talking about radical expressions in this video. To begin, I thought we'd start off with something that is pretty familiar, the square root of 9. Now, you may not know this, but even though there's no number in this area, there actually is a 2. So whenever you don't see something there, that is a 2. That's called the index. That's telling us what type of root we're supposed to be taking. So in other words, this is saying, what number can you square to get the number inside? The number inside is called the radicand. So what number can I square to get 9? That's 3. Since the square root was already there, we're just going to assume that it's the positive answer. On the second example, we have a cube root of 8. So what number can I cube to get 8? That would be 2. Ah, now we have the cube root of negative 8. You might be so um, ingrained, something's ingrained in you to say that the answer is going to be imaginary, but remember that we're doing a cube root. You might not have a lot of experience with that. There actually is a number that you can cube to get negative 8, and it's not imaginary. It's just negative. The answer to that would be negative 2, because negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 gets you negative 8. So notice, when you have an odd index, you can have a negative or a positive answer. If I were to try to take the square root of a negative 9, that would be an even index, I do not get a real number, right? This would be an imaginary number. I'd get 3i. We're just going to focus on things that have real answers. Like the square root of x squared. If you want to put the little 2 in here for the index, you're more than welcome to. What number can I square to get x squared? Well, that's x. But don't be too fast about this one. Let's check it out. I like using examples to see if it makes sense. What happens if x is 4? The square root of 4 squared is supposed to equal, but we're not sure, so we'll put a little question mark, it's supposed to equal 4, according to what we just wrote down. Is that true? Well, the square root of 16 is 4, and yes, these match. Everything looks great. Ah. Got to try with a negative number, though. Obviously, it's not going to work. You can tell by the tone of my voice. Let's see what happens. The square root of negative 4 squared does it equal negative 4. You can see right away that we have an issue. We have a square root, only the positive version, and it equals a negative number. We know that that can't happen. Notice that squaring is going to turn the radicand positive to give us this positive real answer. These do not match. So this rule worked when x was positive, and it didn't work when x was negative. So could we adjust our answer up here so that it works for both situations? We want to keep the answer as 4 in both situations. What could I do to negative 4 to turn it into a positive 4? I hope you're thinking about absolute value, because that's exactly what we're going to need. Now if I put absolute value on 4, I still have 4. But if I put absolute value on negative 4, it becomes positive 4. And we just turn our frown upside down. What happens if we're taking the cube root of x cubed? What could you cube to get x cubed? Ah, it's the same idea as before. We were going to say the answer is x. And you might think, oh, we're going to need absolute value. Well, not so quick. Remember we said before that if an odd index is the type of index you're working with, you're allowed to have negative answers. We're not going to have to worry about that situation here. So let's kind of summarize what's going on. If the index is odd, right? No need for absolute value. But if it's even, we may need it. 
Let's look at an example to see when we're going to need it. What is the square root of x to the seventh? That's an even index. x to the seventh could really be thought of as x squared times x squared times x squared times x. Now that looks like the original problem we had with the square root of x squared, but it's a bunch of them. Well, we know that the square root of x squared is x, square root of x squared is x, the square root of x squared is x, and the square root of x, we're just going to leave that as the square root of x. So that really becomes x cubed square root of x. Do we need absolute values here? Hmm. Let's think about this. If we had a negative number inside here, and I raised it to the seventh power, it would stay negative. I would get an imaginary answer. And then I wouldn't need to worry about absolute values in the first place. So here, I don't need the absolute value. What's so different about this problem? Well, the exponent was different. In the original problem, we had an x squared, needed the exponent on our answer. Here we have an x to the seventh, we don't. It all has to do with the radicand. If the radicand could be positive, then we're going to get a real answer. Well, it's positive if the exponent is even. So I'm going to say if the index is even, the exponent, the exponent is even, or if the exponent is odd. We just said if the index is even, the exponent is odd, no need for absolute value. Now let's think about one other thing that really mattered. The answer. The solution to the problem. Our solution turned out to have an odd exponent. What if it had had an even exponent? If it had an even exponent, it would have turned itself positive again. If it doesn't have an even, it has an odd exponent, then it's going to need the absolute values. So I'm going to say no absolute value for an even exponent need absolute value if it's an odd exponent. So look at this. These situations, only one of them needs absolute value. Even index, even exponent inside the radicand, and an odd exponent on the solution. Let's try another example. So here for our last two examples, notice we both both examples have an even index. On the first example, we have an even index and an even exponent inside the radicand. So it's like a warning flag, like beware, we might need absolute value. Let's actually take the square root of this. We would get 2m to the fourth. Really what I'm doing is 8 divided by the 2 for the index, right? Because I'm grouping the m, uh, m, the m to the eighth really as m squared times m squared times m squared times m squared. So we had four groups. Does that need an absolute value? No. m to the fourth is going to be positive. We don't really need to worry about that. That one's done. In the next example, even index, the x to the twelfth, right, that has an even exponent. We're going to have to worry about that. The y to the thirteenth, that's odd. Do not have to worry about that. Because if y was negative, y to the thirteenth is also going to be negative. And now we're already dealing with an imaginary answer. So we're not going to um, need absolute values for the y portion, but we may need them for the x. Now the fourth root of 15, is there a number I could raise to the fourth power and get 15? Mm, there is. It's not a whole number, though. I'm going to leave the 15 inside the fourth root. Now let's move on to the x to the twelfth power. When I take the fourth root, I could just do 12 divided by 4 and get x cubed. I like to put anything that's simplified not in the radical before the answer part with the radical. So I get x cubed. 
even index, even exponent inside the radicand, odd exponent in your answer, that needs absolute value. Now for the y to the 13th. Well, 13 divided by 4 is really 3 remainder 1. So that means we can put a y to the 3rd outside. You know what else I'm going to do? This was way too squished. We want to make sure that it's very clear what's an exponent, what's an index, and what's not together. Like, that wouldn't be a 34. You want to keep those separate. Just like that. So, sorry. We said y to the 13th is really going to be split up into y to the 3rd. That's like taking the 4th root of y to the 12th. And you're going to have an extra y left over. Well, I'm not going to take the 4th root of that and simplify it. I'm just going to leave it inside the 4th the root there. So that's what our answer would be. So part of it has an absolute value. Parts of it don't.